And she was unfortunately ill and um, has asked that I fill in for her while she's uh, recovering. And so though while I work in the HIV department and know a lot about STIs in my formal life as an ID clinician, uh, this is not what my daily job is. But I think this is a good opportunity then to um, try to see how we can bring some of the conversation that was just happening right now around PrEP and HIV into the context of STIs and where we're headed with WHO in terms of reaching towards universal health coverage, the sustainable development goals. And um, so forgive me if I get anything wrong, and I forgive me if I repeat anything that was said over the last two days, because I know you've had a very re rich discussion. But I, I, when I first saw these slides, because uh, I was just excited to see that, look, there's a beautiful picture of condoms on the beach. You know, not only are we having plastic on the beach, but we're having condoms on the beach. But I think this is uh, important that also, from the WHO's perspective, condoms still are part of our protection, and we need to continue to be thinking about condom scale-up for HIV as well as for SDI protection. So you'll probably have had a number of presentations on sort of the global epidemiology. But focusing on what's important at the global level for WHO, we still have 370,000 adverse birth outcomes leading to stillbirths of approximately 200,000 due to congenital syphilis. And this is fully preventable, and we do have a plan to eliminate uh, uh, maternal to child's transmission of syphilis, and this is something like with HIV, we just, we know what to do and we just aren't doing it everywhere that it needs to be done. We also have nearly 300,000 cases every year of um, HPV cervical cancer deaths as well. Then we look into the morbidity, and I'm sh we know that STIs compromise people's quality of life. We have cases of infertility, which is now going to be part of a WHO um, approach to looking at infertility that is linked to STIs that are untreated. We know that HSV2 um, is also can increase the risk of HIV. HSV2 and HIV co-infection also can be a risk for transmission onward, and that we know um, having this syndemic between HIV and STIs leads to greater transmission. When we start to look at the sustainable development goals, we've moved away from the MDGs where we really had specific targets, a maternal and child mortality reduction, and now we have a general um, SDG3 on health, which is about good health and well-being. So all of us who have been working in what might be considered our verticalized programs really need to identify what are the pieces that we can't let go and that we need to find that are starting to build the case for integrated plan, integrated services and ways where we can address um, STIs within that system. So in the overarching um, health goal number three, we have sub-targets or health targets of Two, reducing child uh, and neonatal mortality, reducing NCDs and improving mental health, uh, reducing the and ending the epidemics of AIDS, TB, malaria, and NTDs, and combating ha hepatitis and other communicable diseases. So as you can see from the world of the UN, all infectious diseases need to end in this, uh, with the SDGs by 2030. And then develop uh, universal health care uh, and including protecting the financial risks and improving sexual and reproductive health. So I'm going to walk through a bit of what WHO is doing in this regard and how we've set up either frameworks and or health sector strategies that will help us to achieve some of those goals. So in 2016, the WHO HIV and hepatitis department paired up with the STI department and put out three sister documents that reflect each other in terms of the global health sector strategy. And they go from 2016 to 21, 2021 and have been then subsequently approved um, both at the Global World Health Assembly and also at the regional level. So that member states have committed to these actions within there. And I, what I can say is we have 90-90-90s for the HIV, which you'll hear about. We also have a 90-90-70 within this document for STIs. So 90% reduction in syphilis incidents globally, 90% reduction of gonorrhea incidents globally, and 90% uh, national coverage of treatment 
for HPV. So they're slightly different 9090s, but I think they're also ambitious targets that we should be hopefully trying to strive for, um, even though a little bit more complex from what you've heard here over the last two days. In terms of number two, reducing childhood child and neonatal mortality, the focus of the WHO, HIV, and RHR department, or reproductive health um, and research department, is around the dual elimination of mother-to-child transmission of both syphilis and HIV, and soon we're to add hepatitis to that, something called triple elimination. So what we know for syphilis is that 52% of pregnant women who are infected with syphilis and go untreated will have an adverse outcome. And this leads to approximately 400,000 adverse outcomes. And they lead to th things such as stillbirth, neonatal death, preterm delivery, and congenital disease that goes with that child for, that, for the lifetime. And these are completely treatable, as you know. There's cost-effective and very low-cost interventions. We have both a rapid treponemal test. We have dual tests now for HIV and syphilis, and soon we'll be adding that hepatitis arm to those rapid tests as well. And we can treat relatively safely and easily with benzenine penicillin, penicillin, and we use partner notification and treatment to ensure that the mother doesn't get reinfected. However, we have plenty of missed opportunities at the global level and I'm sure at the local level where in ANC, you can see here in the orange, ANC tested for syphilis and treated is very small across the board in the regions. <coughs> and these are the six regions that are followed by in, uh, in uh, WHO. <coughs> and what you will see is that we have many missed opportunities where women come in, they're either tested but not treated, or, t or in ANC and not even treated once they know. <coughs> not tested, I'm sorry. We also have a problem of penicillin shortages, and I think this is kind of unreasonable to understand why such a cheap drug, a drug that can be produced for pennies, is still unavailable in many places in the world. And this is something where HIV has <clears throat> been very active in taking on and being activists about having drugs available, and perhaps the STI community needs to take on the same level of activism. We also know that we have to do the screening. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so maybe Maybe there's something running in the water at WHO. We're all sick. Yeah. Sorry about that. <coughs> um, and if we don't have benzenine penicillin, then we need to look for other treatments. We're also supporting countries on this dual elimination, and we already have 10 countries that have been validated for syphilis elimination. And Elimination doesn't mean that there's no syphilis being transmitted. It means that it's coming down to a level that is low enough that we feel like the public health problem is becoming under control in terms of a public health approach. And for syphilis, we're looking for an incidence of less than 50 cases per 100,000 births. <coughs> Pardon me. When we go to ending the epidemics of TB, HIV, and malaria, Really, the focus for the um, STI area is PrEP, which we heard a lot about just recently, and now tackling antimicrobial-resistant gonorrhea. And I'm sure you had presentations on that today. So this slide, we, WHO likes to show lots of maps. And this slide shows the natural rollout, where you actually have widespread rollout of PrEP and where you just have project implementation or pharmacy access. And I think until this becomes a bit more widespread, it, um, it won't be necessarily affecting the, the reduction of incidence of HIV in the way that we know it needs to. But there's potentially um, a non-silver lining in terms of a concern that even if we don't have transmission of HIV, we may start to see some level of STI increasing. And this data comes from Kaiser Permanente in, South, in San Francisco. So we do need to be able to watch for this and be sure that we're, 
looking for opportunities to reduce the transmission of STIs as well as HIV. <coughs> and I think part of what's missing that HIV has quite well is tests that can be done at the point of care. So PCR for gonorrhea, PCR for chlamydia, opportunities to have point of care diagnostic and immediate treatment and partner management. We also know that AMR is becoming a big problem. And if you've been watching the AMR world, it's not just for STIs, it's for many of the gram negatives. But I think gonorrhea is particularly one that WHO and the world is taking very seriously. And we have a global uh, gonococcal antimicrobial resistance surveillance system or program called GASP. And what we're seeing already is that cephalosporins, we have out of those countries that are reporting, 52% have de seen a decreased sus susceptibility to cephalosporins, 82% decreased susceptibility to azithromycin, and for quinolones, much higher at 95%. So that means, yes, we are starting to get very worried about our drugs and what we can use to treat gonorrhea. You may have also heard in the news about the super gonorrhea, and we're starting to see those strains that are resistant to both cephalosporins and azithromycin. So <coughs> the, what the response from WHO is to really put out a comprehensive STI case management approach to have enhanced monitoring of gonorrhea, or EGASP, to inform national and treatment guidelines, and to have antibiotic and diagnostic stewardship, and to have con uh, an essential medicine and some stewardship that can occur. Because we do know that part of AMR is we don't want people around the world to be go able to go into a pharmacy and be able to access the most valuable uh, useful antibiotics um, without a diagnosis, and that is happening many places in the world. The other areas that are up for discussion now with gonorrhea is really about the development of new treatments, point of care, <clears throat> and to facilitate the development of a vaccine. And I think that this is very exciting, and WHO will be pulling a group together in the fall to be able to look at the vaccine development and put out some guidelines around the vaccine development. In terms of the fourth element of SDGs, eliminating cervical cancer and HPV screening, WHO takes a very much of a life course approach to eliminating cervical cancer and has guidance around primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. And in terms of the HPV vaccine, it has been mostly targeted towards girls, but in the HIV world, we definitely want it targeted towards boys as well. And we would like to see that also we have women who um, have had high-risk HPV, that they have access to the vaccine as well, and treatment for invasive cancer. And right now at WHO, they are undergoing a revision of the um, guidance around uh, invasive cervical cancer and how to use ablative sur surgery versus radiotherapy versus chemotherapy. But we know we don't have enough countries with full vaccination, especially in Africa, and I think that's going to be important and in Asia to change. We don't have full cervical screening that's happening around the world, so you can see that it's very limited in certain parts of the world. So in May of 28, May 18th, 2018, the DG put out a call for elimination of cervical cancer and with a joint platform with many partners to really try to work towards the full elimination of cervical cancer by making both the vaccine and the approaches for screening, for treating, uh, uh, available. So I think another area that's really important in STIs is integrated health. And today I was at another session where we're talking about how we need to integrate both STI treatment, but also family planning and HIV testing and treatment services together. And I think once more of this happens under the umbrella of universal health coverage and we should have improved outcomes. Major challenges, I'm sure you know, is that we have many asymptomatic cases, especially in women. So <clears throat> WHO is really taking on an approach of moving away from, not moving away fully, 
but differentiating around the syndromic management. And I'm sure that's been something that um, has been discussed perhaps here. So we're taking a screening with point of care testing for high risk persons, so more of a an actual etiological management and syndromic <coughs> in primary areas based upon risk-based scre screening and then working better in the community for advocacy and counseling. <coughs> so there are three dimensions of the UHC for STI control. And right now, under the universal health coverage framework, there is interventions around the vaccines and condoms, early diagnosis and treatment, partner notification, and I think exciting areas in the gonococcal AMR and vaccine development and HPV vaccines. So with this integrated response, there should be an ability to combat AMR, eliminate neonatal outcomes, reduce the HIV transmission, prevent cancer, reduce infertility, and support young people. And I think at that point I have to end. 